Hello everyone, and welcome to this mini lecture on Emily Dickinson and her poetry. The word cloud that you're seeing right now uh, is a collection of her works, all of her poetry, and thrown into a word cloud. And these are the major, the, the larger the word that you see, the more it is, it is repeated in the entire collection of her works. So just a little interesting look at what's there. All right, Emily Dickinson uh, was bo born in 1830, died in 1886, and lived l much of her life in western Massachusetts, uh, in Amherst to be, to be precise, and it's largely considered a secluded life. Um, she certainly did go out, but she spent much, she did not have much of a public life. Uh, a lot of it was in the confines of her home and um, with family. She wrote over 1,700 poems, uh, the vast majority of which were published after her death. Uh, she only published a handful of poems during her life, and, you know, of those, well, she only published a handful of poems throughout her life. The rest were published by, family, by her family after she had passed away. Throughout... The history of Emily Dickinson as a part of American literature, there has been questions raised about her mental state. Uh, some, you know, it varies, you know, many, but many would, would believe she was depressed or suffered some kind of mental illness that kept her, you know, in part in that secluded uh, home in Amherst. So I'm going to look at some of the qualities of, uh, of Emily Dickinson's poetry because Despite her not publishing much during her life, she has been published substantially since then and regularly is seen as one of the major poets out there. Uh, she is one of the major voices of American literature, though not until you get into the 19th, into the 1900s. But she shows up in anthologies, uh, you know, across the world, all different types of poetry anthologies. She's a very important voice within the, po the, the poetic canon. Uh, not just the American literary canon. So when we look at her poetry, uh, we have to we have to know a couple things about them. Some are unfinished, right? So all of these were published, but that doesn't necessarily mean all of them are finished. Um, so there are various ones that are unfinished. There are ones that are uh, there's several drafts that are out there of some poems, uh, and so some editors will finish those themselves, or you know choose among several different drafts of a sp singular poem. So we know there's multiple drafts of poems that some of them are unfinished, uh, that none of them have titles. Now you'll often see a, a Emily Dickinson poem will have a title to it, but all that title is is often just the first line taken um, and put as a title, even though rather than having no title at all. Uh, in that, the vast many of them are passionate poems, and I think this is important: is that even though Dickinson had the secluded life, she had a very passionate inner world. Her mind was so rich with ideas and experiences and thoughts and they they boil through in her collection of over 1700 poems. So I, I think it's one of those instances where we should never mistake the fact that her life isn't what we would expect for or confuse that with what she can create. Um, that those two things don't always go hand in hand. That there can be, in this case, you know, what looks like a very secluded life, what looks like a very limited experience of life, and yet she's able to tap into amazing passion and, and beauty. There's also something to be said of her punctuation. Uh, some people, you know, she uses in particular a lot of dashes, M dashes, in her writing. And there's been different theories around what that means, its importance, its relevance, all of those things. Um, some would argue that the M dash, that double dash that she uses throughout her poetry, is, rep is representative or is similar to the... A kind of shift in mind, uh, a a you're you know a, as a mind jump. That is, you're thinking about one thing and then bam, you're off thinking about something else. Well, that's how she, or that's how some people have argued that she uses the dashes. Is that you, 
it's kind of a jump ship to something else. That something else may be related, but it's still almost a, a quick move into another area. All right, so common themes in her poems, um, transition, change, right? Things are, you know, th this metamorphosis that's taking place before her eyes, uh, things that are going from one state to another. And what we see is there's a lot of back and forth. That is, she plays both both sides of many of these themes. So she talks about transition and change, but then other poems have a lot, uh, uh, you know, way heavy around the idea of permanence and um, the idea of what permanence looks like in different ways. Mortality, uh, which is its own type of transition in, in permanence, right? You, you live life, which is continual transition, and you transition into death, which is, of course, continual uh, permanence of, of non-living. But death and mortality, living and dying are, are major themes we see within our poems. So, And then also immortality, you know, going on forever. And that's not necessarily human immortality, but things or, or something going well beyond our comprehension. Certainly love, and we see a lot of that, you know, she is well known for, uh, some of her poems are well known, love poems that are that show up again in, you know, anthologies on love and all of that. Pain, uh, there are various ways, and, and we're not just talking physical pain, we're talking mental pain, ways in which, you know, th there's anguish, there's an interior anguish that she speaks to, and this is where others, you know, have found evidence or, or believe there's evidence of, you know, her having some kind of um, mental health issue. And of course, the inner world, kind of what goes on in one's own brain, in one's own mind, what what are those experiences like? How do you capture, how do you make sense of your inner world? And how do you externalize it so other people can understand your inner world? There's also ecstasy. And no, we're not talking about the drug. Uh, we're talking about, you know, that, that supreme sense of the supreme feeling that can be and often is religiously inspired, but just of, of fullness and, and intensity uh, that can be triggered by other things in one's life. There's of course a strong theme of a strong vein of nature throughout much of her writings and in using nature to communicate different ideas and experiences. Um, so those are the major themes and ideas that we see. So why don't we take a look at two of her poems, uh, and then hopefully that will give you some grounds to look at the other poems that we're reading for um, this section. So here we have, The show is not the show, but that they go. Menagerie to me, my neighbor be. Fair play, both went to see. Right? The show is not the show but they that go. And here's one of those places where it's important to pay attention to, uh, not to the lines, or rather pay attention both to the lines, but also the actual punctuation. So the show is not the show, but they that go. So the, the author, of, or I should say the, the voice, uh, the poet of this poem, who isn't necessarily Emily Dickinson, but maybe some fictional person, um, the show isn't interesting, but those that go to the show, right? That's what's that's what's fascinating. Menagerie to me, my neighbor be. So the author's here saying, man, there there's such an interesting mix of people that you know that there's such a mix of people to me that consists of my neighbor or my neighbors. Fair play, both we see. So here's a fascinating little poem. The poem, you know. Emily Dickinson is not talking about talking about or she is talking about going to a show but she's not actually interested in what's on stage she's interested in what her neighbors are like she's interested in, in observing not the stage but the people around her they're a menagerie they're a mixture of people of, of you know different kinds and views and clothing and appearances and for her you know, she gets her money worth. She gets her money's worth, not by the play that's on the stage, but by the people around her. So it's a very interesting voyeuristic poem. Uh, this idea that we go and we look. You know, this is what we call people watching. We do it all the time, right? We go somewhere, and, and you know, whatever we're doing, we're also partaking of this idea of people watching. All right. 
Now comes, of course, one of my favorites, uh, which is referred to as Wild Nights. So, Wild Nights, Wild Nights. Were I with thee, Wild Nights should be our luxury. Futile, futile the winds to a heart in port. Done with the compass, done with the chart. Rowing in Eden, ah, the sea, might I but more to night in thee. So we've got a lot of different images here. They all seem to be around sailing. Um, but this is a very, very sexual poem. And it, make no mistake, there is, you know, Dickinson is saying some really interesting, vibrant things. So she's saying, wild nights, wild nights, right? An exclamation point, you know, capital, you know, exciting, exciting, wild. Not, ju you know, not just exciting, but wild. Were I with thee, wild nights should be our luxury, right? So she's saying, if I were you, you know, or if I was with you, oh man, you know, we could have wild nights all the time. Fuel the winds to a heart in port, right? So this idea of, of uh, you know, the, the winds would not be a problem to a heart in port, right? Because if we're thinking of a ship, a ship in port is safe. A heart in port is safe. Done with the compass, done with the chart, so done with those tools needed to find the port. Rowing in Eden, right? So ships would have to, you know, would essentially park in the port and then take a rowboat to the shore. Ah, the sea, might I but more tonight in thee. That rowing in Eden, right? It's, it's there, you know, Eden is this angelic place, right? It, but it's also the place where people are naked. And so kind of that exclamation point of, ah, the sea, and my I but more tonight in thee. There's a very strong sexual implication about what that entails, right? Very much this is about, you know, the opportunity of two lovers to be together and to embrace and enjoy such a wild night. You could also look at this as very, you know, you could look at this as a, as also just love, but I think the imagery, the, the presence of, um, you know, the, the idea of a storm, right, the idea of waves, these are all images that evoke action, and in particular, a sexual action, a back and forth, right? If we think of waves, waves in, simil in some ways are very much like sexual interaction. There's a back and forth that occurs, and you know, you throw in Eden there, a reference to Eden, which is, of course, a place where people were known to be naked. There, there seems to be a much stronger uh, presence here, on, a focus here on sex as opposed to just love. All right, those, uh, those are our poems. There's a lot more that we get to look at with Emily Dickinson, and I hope this gives you some sense of um, how to start to work with her poetry. Thank you very much for listening.